So the topic is on business statistics. I understand this is not the first time you have heard this term statistics. More often you have come across statistics and uh, maybe you might be wondering what is all these statistics that we normally talk about. In Kenya, we have an institution that is actually charged with the statistics of the country and that is the Kenya Bureau of Statistics. And actually the work it does it is what the definition for this particular chapter is talking about. It is a science of collecting, organizing, presenting, analyzing, and interpreting data to assist in making more effective decisions. As a country, we might be interested in knowing the, the cost of living. For us to be able to know the cost of living, we shall have to do some statistics. We go ahead and we find out what is the, uh, the level of income of the consumers who are now the citizens. We get to know the prices of the basic commodities. After getting all that information, that is the part of our collecting data. When we go to find out, majority of the citizens are actually getting an income of how much? That is collecting the data. After collecting that data, we shall have a responsibility of organizing. Organizing. When you collect data and you find that maybe person A is earning 20,000 per month, person B is earning 3,000 per month, and all that, that information is just very low and it needs to be organized. You can organize it to have it in a better uh, way. And actually, then we can have a presentation of the same, whereby we shall grow the graphs, the curves, the pie charts, and all that. That is the presentation. And then we analyze and we interpret to find now the most effective decision as a country that we need to take. So that aspect of collecting the data is actually now what is called the statistics. Actually in the Kenya and actually in the year 2019, there was the census. When the census is being conducted, that is collecting the data. And then they are going to have that particular data organized presented, analyzed, and interpreted for a more effective decisions to be made. How many people are in each county so that we can know how much money to be sent in those counties and all that. And those are the decisions that we are making as a result of the statistical data that was gathered. Then you need to know that uh, statistics is of two types. We have got the statistics we call the descriptive statistics. And the descriptive statistics is simply uh, getting the data and presenting that data in form of tables and graphs, in form of tables and graphs or charts, that is the descriptive statistics. I know you have heard about the bar charts, the pie charts, the line graphs, the cumulative frequency curves. When you draw those particular graphs or charts using the data, then you are exercising what we call the descriptive statistics. Then we have got the other type of statistics known as the inferential statistics. And inferential statistics here means that to make sure that the data that we have analyzed and presented, it is more reliable, so we can do some tests. So these are methods of drawing and measuring the reliability of conclusions that have been made about statistical data. We can say that the mean age of Kenyan people is maybe that five years, but how true is that? We need to do some tests and those tests that we are going to conduct, we are now going to involve what we call the inferential statistics to find out whether the conclusions that have been made are actually correct. And here now, the inferential statistics can be made on a population or a sample. So when we talk about a population, it is when we are considering all the items. Like for example, when we do statistics in form of a census, when we involve each and every person, then it is actually referred as a population. But uh, sometimes it's very hard to find all those particular elements. It might be very hard to find all of them, and therefore you can only get a few. You do the test on the few, and then the results that will come from the few you generalize it to be the result for the entire population. So like, for example, if I'm conducting uh, some statistics to do with the CHRM students, 
I go there and I find it maybe in CHRM there are 800 students, but I find it very hard to find all the 800 students. Maybe I want to know what is the, the mean age or what is the average age of the CHRM students. Because it is very hard for me to get the, all the 800, I might decide only to look for 50 students. And when I go to the 50 students and I get their age, I get their mean age, the mean age of the 50, I normally extend it or I take it to be the mean age for the entire 800 students. So if I'm able to get the, uh, the 800, then I will be doing a statistics on the population. The population here, it is all the individuals that are under consideration. When we talk about a sample, it is when we take a smaller number from the population and then we do some tests or we do some statistics on them. The conclusion that we are going to make from the few, which is the sample, we are going to conclude that is going to be the, the, the statistics for the entire data. Then the other thing that you needed to know is about the variables. A variable is a measurable characteristic. A variable is a measurable characteristic. Like for example, I might be interested in measuring age or finding the mean age, the mod age, the median age, and all that. Therefore, age is a variable. It can be height, height is a variable. It can be the mean income. Income is a variable because it is measurable. It can be the distance. Anything that is measurable and it's actually an attribute, that particular item is considered as a variable. We have got quite a number of variables. We have got quite a number of variables. One, we have got the independent variable. The independent variable, it is a variable that is actually going to be like a predictor. It is a variable which when adjusted or manipulated by the researcher, it will have an impact on another variable. It is actually known as the predictor. It is considered as the predictor. Like for example, you can have two items. You want to know if, for example, I increase the fertilizer in my farm, what will be the effect on the quantity that I'm going to harvest? So you have got two things, eh? the amount of fertilizer and the amount of harvest. So the fertilizer here, it is going to be considered independent variable because if it is adjusted, it is the one that can cause the change in the uh, production. And then now, the level of production now, it is going to be considered as dependent. Dependent because it is going to depend on the fertilizer. So the independent is the variable that is being manipulated or adjusted. The dependent variable is the variable that is going to be affected by the adjustment that is going to be made on the independent variable. So we can have another example. Like for example, if you want to know what will be the effect of increasing the price of a commodity versus now the quantity that the consumers are going to demand. You'll find that maybe if I increase the price of this commodity, very few people are going to be interested in buying the item because the item is becoming expensive. But if I reduce the price, then you find that very many people are interested in buying that because the product is affordable. So when we talk about the price and the quantity demanded, price is the independent value. Price is the independent variable because it is the one that is being adjusted and causing effect on the quantity that is demanded. And thus, the quantity that is being demanded is going to be considered as the dependent variable. So we have got those two, first of all, the dependent and the independent. Dependent is what causes, uh, what is affected by the adjustment in that. I am so sure when you did it, you are research for those who did uh, the uh, research in module two of certificate level, you did the dependent variables. What are your variables of research? These are the variables that are going to be affected when uh, there is a change in another variable we call independent variable. So if you have not done that, when you go to your module three, you will have to do your research and actually you are going to come across these variables. What are your variables of research? Then you have got what we call qualitative and quantitative variables. 
qualitative and quantitative variables. So qualitative variables are those variables that are uh, that cannot be expressed in numbers. Those variables which cannot be expressed in numbers or uh, they cannot be attached a number or a figure, they are known as qualitative. Like for example, a region, there is no way you can attach a number in the region. The region either you are Christian, uh, Muslim, or Hindu, or any other that we have, but there is no way we can say it is one, two, or three. Such attributes or those attributes are considered qualitative. We have others like the gender. Gender is either male or female, the color, the state, all that. Then we have the quantitative variables. They are variables that we can express in numbers. We can actually say that this one can be given this particular figure. And they can be of two types. They can either be discrete or continuous. Discrete variables are those which can only take a certain whole number. They can only take a certain whole number and they, they are actually known as the, the counted variables. So a good example it can be when we measure maybe your height and we go recording it. Maybe Daniel has got a height of 8.2. We record that. We have the other one is maybe having a height of seven. We record it as individual or single numbers. They are known as discrete. But when we have the continuous, there are variables which can occupy a certain range. We can actually organize the same data in discrete to be continuous. And wherever you can say maybe the age, the age from zero to five years, from five to 10 years, from 10 to 15 years. So we have got a range, we have got a range. And then from there, we can count how many people have got the age of zero to five years relate to the number. So when variables, they take a particular range, then they are known as continuous variables. Then we have got controllable variables and uncontrollable variables. Controllable variables are those which can actually be uh, adjusted. Eh? Those variables which the researcher can be able to manipulate, they are controllable. Like the price, you can adjust the price of your product. You can adjust your budget. You can adjust even the time you open your shop and all that. Those factors which are beyond the mandate of the manager or the researcher, they are known as controllable. The uncontrollable variables are those which are beyond the control of the researcher or any organization or manager. Like for example, changing the technology. If technology changes as an organization, you cannot be able to have an impact or adjust it. The competition, the natural calamities and all that, those are the things which are beyond the organization and they are considered as uncontrollable. And as an organization, you can only live with it. You can only live with them and uh, just adjust your controllable variables so that they can be able to fit in the uncontrollable variables. And then the characteristics of uh, statistical data. Statistical data, they are aggregates. They are aggregates. Aggregate meaning that it is just like an average or a total. Yeah? They are just aggregate or averages, and then they are affected by the mark extent of a multiplicity of causes. Like for example, the volume. It depends on rainfall. It depends on the fertility of the land. It depends even on the quality of the seeds and all that. So they are affected by other factors. They are affected by other factors. If, for example, we are doing statistics on the level of education, the education level can be affected by many, many things. We have the cultural factors. We know some communities, they don't value education. We also know maybe things like the infrastructure. If a school has got good infrastructure, then it is a subject to performing better than a school that does not have a good infrastructure and such kind of things. They are numerically expressed. Actually, in statistics, we don't consider the quantitative variables. In statistics, we purely talk about the quantitative variables, those variables which can be expressed numerically. And then 
they are estimated according to the reasonable standard of accuracy. And actually, we cannot be 100% accurate. You cannot be 100% accurate. Even when the country is doing the census, the statistics that is going to have, it is not 100%. It is just uh, going to have a certain level of a percentage of accuracy. And here you find that the more the percentage of accuracy, the more reliable the data. Then it is corrected in a systematic way. In a systematic way here, we say that there is a step or we have the steps that need to be followed when you are correcting the data uh, or data, sorry. They are corrected for a predetermined purpose. When you are doing statistics, you are doing that with a certain motive at uh, the back of your mind. And they should be placed in relation to each other. Like for example, when we do the census, we can say that the census for 2019, you find that there was increase in the population by 10% compared to the census that was done in the year 2009. There must be a comparative aspect. There must be a comparative aspect. Then here briefly, we can talk about the users of our statistics. We have the government and why it is statistics for policy making, forecasting, monitoring, economic and social trends and all that. As an individual, you also need the statistics uh, for this kind of things. For those who like gambling, you need the statistics, you do statistics, especially for those who do the betting, you need to know what is there, what is the actually the trend this particular team is uh, portraying. Is it a team that is losing all the matches? What was there? The last five matches played, what were there, the results and all that. The personal finances, you need statistics so that you can do the budgeting. For academic, we normally use statistics in our research and all that. For businesses, it is widely used. That's why it is known as business statistics. For planning and control, forecasting and planning, determining the production cost, all those. Anything that has got advantages, it has disadvantages. The disadvantages of statistics that it deals with aggregate facts and not individual items. You can do exams as a class of 2M, and then I go and record that the mean score of the class was 65%. But you as an individual, you got maybe 85%. So when I go record that the mean score was 65%, which is a very statistic, I'm actually not considering your interest, or actually your interest is not being considered. So it is aggregate and it does not consider individual items. It deals only with the quantitative characteristics and it ignores their qualitative characteristics. And we know in a business kind of setup, both the quantitative aspects and the qualitative aspects can be very important as far as the performance of the organization is concerned. We have got some qualitative aspects, especially motivation, whereby the level of motivation of the employees can determine how successful the organization will be, can determine. And therefore, in statistics, we only consider the quantitative characteristics and we say that they are the ones which are important, but we don't consider the qualitative aspects which are equally important in uh, the performance of a business. And then the results are only true, true to an average and under certain conditions. Remember we are saying we cannot have 100% accurate data and therefore we have a certain percentage of accuracy. So in one way or another, you can find that that particular percentage which is not captured, eh? the percentage which is now the inaccurate part. If we are 90% accurate, then it means that we are 10% inaccurate. And we find that the 10% can also have an impact. And then it can be misused if uh, people make wrong interpretation. And uh, actually not anybody can be presented with the statistical data to make right conclusions. You must have some knowledge, you must have some experience or skills, and uh, statistics may not provide best solution under all circumstances. Some circumstances, statistics might not be the ideal. Then, having looked at the statistics and uh, its importance, its limitation and all that, we can go to how do we correct statistical data, data correction. And here I will say this, data correction 
is from two sources. Data can be collected from two sources. Number one, it can be collected from primary, and number two, it can be collected from secondary. I would like to start with the primary data. Primary data, it is data that is gathered or collected for the first time, and actually we normally call it original data. If you are a student and you are getting data from the primary source, then it simply means that that data, you are collecting it yourself. You are the, part, the first person to collect that particular data. Nobody else has ever collected that data and therefore uh, you cannot get it in books. You can only conduct it yourself and then you analyze it yourself. So primary data can be collected using three methods. It can be collected through observation, it can be collected through interviews, or it can be collected through questionnaires. But as we go there, just know that it is the data that you are collecting it for yourself, and it is actually original data. You cannot read it in books, you cannot get it in magazines, you cannot get it in journals, all that. It is your data, and especially when you are doing your trade project, you are supposed to have in your primary data. When we talk about observation, it is when you get data, you yourself, by just observing the way things are happening. Like, for example, if you are a manager, maybe you are a HR manager somewhere, and you want to know, on average, what is the reporting time of the employees? At uh, what time do many employees come in? You can just do that by observation. You just maybe sit somewhere and you watch or you observe the employees as they come in, and then you record. Maybe employee A has come in at 11.15, uh, sorry, 7.15, the other one is 7.20 and all that, and you correct that data just through observation. Then we have the other method of correcting the primary data through interviews. Interviews is when we have uh, uh, an oral face-to-face -face conversation. You ask somebody a question, that is the interviewee, and you are the interviewer, and you get the responses from that particular person through face-to-face -face conversation in form of an interview. Lastly, it is when we correct that particular data by use of questionnaires. Questionnaire is a printed document. You just check that particular document or print it, and then you present it to the person you want to correct the data from. And then the person will fill that questionnaire and they give it back to you. You get now the answers that are written in that particular questionnaire, and then you extract data from it. Remember data, it is information, or sorry, not information, but raw information, information that is not processed. You just get it so that you can process it to be reasonable. You can ask those people or your employees in form of questionnaires, what do you think is your best or your most frequent time of reporting to one? Then they respond there, and then you go collecting that data from each and every employee. The advantage to this is that it is relevant because you are going to get data that you need. Then it is accurate because you are doing it yourself. The disadvantage it is that it is costly, especially when the respondents are uh, scattered. When they are scattered and you have to travel to get them, it might be very costly. Also, when the questionnaires that need to be printed are very many, again, it's going to be very costly. It is equally time consuming because you need to do it yourself and you move along to get that particular data. The other source of, uh, or the other uh, the data collection source is the secondary. The secondary, it is now the opposite of primary. Whereas the primary, you are collecting data for the first time, it has never been done by anybody else. The secondary data is the information that already exists. It was done by somebody else. That particular person presented it in maybe a book, and then you get that information from the book. You just read. Like, for example, you cannot be able to do a census for the whole country as an individual. What you can do is to get now the report from the Kenya Bureau of Statistics and then you read that particular report. So you find that now you are collecting that particular data from a secondary source because that is not your work, it was done by somebody else. So the advantage is that it is actually cost effective because it, everything was done. Now it is just a matter of reading and then it is readily available. The disadvantage is that the data 
might uh, not exist that you need. You might need a particular data, but nobody has ever bothered to collect data from that area. So you will not get it. The other one, it might be outdated. You can find the it is there, but it is the data that was collected in 1990. Data that was collected in 1990 might not be applicable in 2021. The problem that people of 1990 were facing cannot be the same problem people are facing in 2021. So it might be outdated and therefore unreliable. That was the part of the introduction. Then now we shall go to this particular area, which is on presentation of data. Presentation of data, it is simply after actually correcting the data, you need to present it. And you can present the data either graphically or you can present it in form of a table and maybe graphs and charts. That is actually the area that we are going to dwell this particular evening. And once we have covered that, then uh, we can uh, have a, a break. And then when we meet next week, we go to the measures of central tendency. So let us look at the data presentation. We have the frequency distribution tables, which we shall use extensively in this particular case. But uh, let us start with what is uh, on your screen. But I won't use this. For data presentation, I'm going to make some other, uh, to use some uh, my own examples. And then later on, I'm going to share these notes with you. And uh, then you will be able to get the notes for future reference. So allow me to stop sharing this. And now we go to the board. Data presentation. Once you have the data that you have collected, either from the primary source or from the secondary source, that data needs to be presented. And we are saying, when we talk about data presentation, it is when you present your data in the form of tables, you can present your data in the form of uh, graphs, it can be in the form of charts, things like that. It is actually going to be a pictorial presentation. There is something that you need to draw in the form of a picture to present the data that you have actually corrected. So data can be presented in the following ways. Data can be presented in the following ways. Number one, number one way of presenting the data is through what we call the pie chart. Data can be presented through what we call the pie chart. And a pie chart is simply a circle that has been subdivided into set parts. It is actually a circle that is subdivided, circle that is subdivided into set parts. Each sector is going to have a size equivalent to the amount it represents. So, like for example, if you are given this, a farm has the following has the following animals. The farm uh, the farm has the following different animals. Maybe you have A, the cows, which are equal to maybe let's talk about uh, 40. B, we have got the goods, which are actually eaten. Three, we have got chicken, which they are maybe 120. And maybe four, or D, we have got sheep which may be there are six. Then you are told to present this information in a pie chart. So 
What you will be required to do in this case, first of all, you get the total. You get the total of animals. You get the total of animals in that arm. You get the total of animals in that arm. In this case, you find that these are uh, 200, they are 300. Let me add something so that we can have a whole number of this. Uh, we can have B, we have what, what we call the ducts, which are also 60. So that if we add this, if we add this, this is uh, 100, 200, they are actually 360. If you want to present that, you need to convert these figures into degrees. Because a circle, when you consider a circle, a circle has got 360 degrees. A circle has got 360 degrees. So what you would be required to do is to get what is the percentage that is represented by the cows. So for the cows, they are going to have a, a circle with the following degrees. They are 40 out of 360. Then we multiply by the number of degrees. One of each rotation is normally 360 degrees. So you find that they are going to be presented by a sector that has got 40 degrees. For the goats, they are going to have 80 out of 360 times 360 degrees. In this case, you find that they are going to be presented by a sector that has got 80 degrees. For the sheep, they are going to be 60 over 360 times 360 degrees. That and that will cancel. You find that they are going to be uh, 60 degrees. I skipped chicken. They are going to be represented by 120, which is the number, divided by the total, which is 360 times 360. You find that it is going to be represented, or they are going to be represented by 120 degrees. We can also talk about the ducks, which will be 60 over 360 times 360 degrees. So they are going to be represented by a sector of 60 degrees. So what you will be required to do as a child or as a student is to come and subdivide this particular circle into sectors. In this case, the chicken, they have got the highest degrees, which is 120 compared to any other. So 120 degrees, you can have it, uh, maybe it's uh, something like that. You say this is 120 degrees, it is representing the chicken. You come here, the next one is maybe 80. 80, you can say something like that. How long is it? This is 80 degrees. Representing what? Goats. Then we have got 60, 60. You can say that is 60. That is 60. This is 60 degrees. One representing that or that. And the other one representing sheep. The other one will be 40 degrees. And that 40 degrees is representing the cows. And that is the final. So when you want to get a title, first of all, you must get the total. You must get the total, and then you convert the individual values that you have into degrees, which is going to be the value of each divided by the total to multiply by 360 degrees. So you get the number of degrees each of uh, those particular items we are representing. So if you are doing a sketch, you must make sure that you are becoming a bit realistic. You cannot have one thing becoming the forever. 
because 120 is the biggest remark maker. This sector of 120 is actually bigger than any other. Then followed by Asia, 60, 60, and then 40 to be the smallest. That is how we come up with the pipe. That is how we come up with the pipe. And I tie that it is one of the ways you can be able to be that number. So even if I'm given this information, without this, I can be able to interpret and say, actually, in that part, chicken are the majority. Chicken are the majority because they are having a higher percentage in that. And then I can also conclude that the number of animals which are the, the, the two extents or the, the animals that are few in the number, they are actually the cows because they are actually being represented by a very small sector here, like that. So that is how we can present the data. And the data wants to present it. Even if this actual information is not supplied to the user of that particular information, the user can be able to update that particular data and make conclusions from it. That is the pie chart. The other way data can be presented, data can be presented in form of uh, what we call the farmers. Data can be presented in form of what we call the bar graphs. Also known as the bar This is number two way of presenting data. A bar graph, it is actually a chart that is going to have bars. It is going to have rectangular bars. We are going to have rectangular bars of equal width of equal width and uniform width and uniform width is rectangular bars of equal width and uniform width is then we can say that with the heights with the heights equivalent Height equivalent to the value or amount they represent. They are going to be bad. And then on that note, you can say this that they are now. There are four types of bar. Bar graphs. There are four types of bar graphs. Number one, we have what we call the simple bar graph. Number two, we have got the multiple Number three, we have got the component. And then number four, we have got what we call the percentage. Of chance. We have got four of them when it comes to bankers. But remember, they must fulfill this condition. They must be rectangular bars of equal width, uniformly spaced, but the heights, they are not actually equal. It depends with the value they present. So, the first thing, if you draw your bar graph, before we go to the real demonstration, on the x axis, we normally have the value that we cannot be able to measure or accurate aspects. It can be maybe the age. Uh, the age, we can talk about something like the year. We can talk about the years here. The years and here, maybe we talk about the production. So, for that particular time, it is going to have uniform width from there to there, and then you come and go the other one. The width of this one and this one they must be the same. They must have the same width. 
And actually, if you continue and grow the other, maybe the other one is having that right. Just to demonstrate before you them. They must have the same width. So if you have skipped, if the, the bar is actually one box, this one also must be one box, this one must have the width of one box box. If you have decided to skip one box here, you also skip one box. So you should not have a bar chart that is behaving like this. You should not have a bar chart where one bar it is very wide, the other one it is very very slender, and then the third one maybe you have come and you have grown it here. The spacing must be the same. The width of the bars is the same. Those are very, very crucial conditions when it comes to doing the bar. So I want us one by one, we demonstrate how do we draw a simple backup, how do we draw a multiple backup, how do we draw a component, and how do we draw a percentage backup. That is my responsibility here to show you. I want to come up with the data which we shall use in demonstrating those forms. Let us have this data. Maybe you have this. Four types of bar graphs. 
Remember, these conditions must be fulfilled in each case. Let me draw them here. I want to start with the first one. Which is the simple one. So with the simple background, actually remember I say the attributes that actually are authoritative in nature are the ones that we are going to put on the next axis. And these others that are measurable, they are going to be on the y axis. So on the x axis here, we are going to have layers. And here we are going to have the bars. The number of bars that was produced. So, in our case here, for the simple bar graph, we normally use the total. For the simple bar graph, we normally use the totals. Uh, use the totals. So, in this case, we have got 2012, 2013, 2014. Those are the years that we are considering. So, here we can have now the Data, maybe we can have a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Am I going to get all the way up to 170? Let me use 2020. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. 140, 160, 180. But you can use, remember, you have your big uh, graph paper whereby you can actually have a better scale than like this. So, what I do for 2012, the total was 120. So, it will have a height of 120. Where we have 120 here, we just make sure that our bar is having that height. For 2019, the total is 170. So it is going to go as high as uh, 170. 170 is between 160 and 180. So it is going to be somewhere there. Remember, you observe the conditions, the spacing from here to here, and also the width of the bar, the math is the same. The other one, 2014, the total production is 150. 150 to 140 and 160. So you will know that. So those are the bars that are shared there. And whatever will come out is known as a simple bar. That is a simple bar that we have using the focus of using the focus of the figures. So each particular year, we are going to have only one bar, only one bar like that. So if you are given the data like this, you just add. The total will not be given, so you just add to get the totals, and now you go it like that. On the x-axis, we normally don't have the scale. We don't have the scale. It is a matter of making sure that the bars are of the same width, and the spacing between one part and the next, it is actually also uniform or constant. That is a simple part. Mm -hmm. That is a simple background. Then we go to the next type of background, which is known as the multiple background. Multiple background, uh, where we have what? Multiple background is actually also very easy. Let me have zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. I think that is the height. In the multiple bar graphs, we don't use the bottom bar. We don't use the bottom bar. Let me write here. This is an all bar graph. That is a multiple bar graph. 
But what we normally do is this. What we normally do is this. For each and every year, remember that when we have 2012, we have got three types of crops. May, beans, and wheat. So for the year 2012, each of these crops and their production, they are going to be represented on their own bars. They are going to be represented on their own bars. Like for example, maybe if it's 50 bars in 2012, it is going to have a height of 50. That. Beans, it has a height of 40. This bars they must be going together. The other one is the wheat, which is having a production of that. So it must have where you have that thing, like that. So you say that is the production of 20. So this bars they are going to each other, then we can share that way. The other one we can share it differently, then we can share it like that, and then the other one we can share it like that. So for the 2012. Each of the item it is having its own bar, but those bars, because all of them are for 2012, they are joined together. Where this one ends, the other one begins the activity like that. That is for 2012. For 2019, you skip now, you skip a step here. For 2019, base was 70, so you going to have a height of 70. Beans, they were actually back to back, so they throw it like that. And then wheat, they were selling it. So they throw it like that. So that is for 20 and 10. Again, the names they are shaded like that. The same way you shaded it here. For the beans, we decided to shade it this way. That is for the beans. And for the wheat, we are shading the same way we shaded this one. That, that is now the multiple bar for 2018. For 2014, we do the same. You skip, you skip, and then you come here. Maybe they were 60 bars. So you have that height of 60 there. Beans, they were 50 bars. And then the other one is 40. For maize, that is the pattern. For beans, the pattern is like that. And for wheat, the pattern is like that. 20, 14. Once you have done that, it is advisable for you to have a key. You can have here what we call the key. You say those bars that are shaded like that. They represent maids. The bars that are traded like this, they represent beans. And those that are traded like this, they are from the beans. That is how we come up with a multiple banner. So once you choose a particular pattern for maize, every year the maids should have the same pattern. For the beans, it is like boxes, they should be the same for the three years. So that this key that you are doing here, it is going to be used for all those three years. So don't shade maize this way this year. The next year you shade it different. It is going to be very hard for you to have a key. That is what we call the multiple partner. Each year, the items are going to have their individual heights, but they are compact. They are together. Then you skip to consider the next. Remember, it cannot be always here. Huh? You can have other aspects. Maybe you are not, uh, you are being told about the production in three villages, village A, village B, village C. So we are going to have village A. So it is not a matter that every time you will be asked about the years. You can also be talked about maybe it is there, the, the courses. Maybe you can find it in Econ. We have uh, maybe education and all that, and then here it is the unit and those costs. You need to know that you can be given any attribute, but remember, here I told you, you 
normally get caught on something that is actually not a pressure on them. Then qualitative uh, variables, the qualitative variables. Having shown you how we do there, the multiple bar graph, I can come back here and show you what on the component bar graph. The component bar graph. The component bar graph. The component bar graph. Just from the one component, it is actually a bar that has been subdivided into components, into sections. So it is actually a simple bar graph, but that simple bar graph is divided into components. So we shall have our simple bar graph one. Remember, 2012, the total was 120, so we have to go our 120 bar, or a bar of one, the height of 120. The other one is 170. Then the other one is 120. Like that. For each and every year. After doing that, now this uh, simple bar, it is now subdivided into components. Whereby this one 20, 50 is for days. So you just come here where we have 50 between 40 and 60. You draw the line. And you say, from that, that is the component for me. 50. Yeah? You just measure the first one is 50. Then these, they were photo bags. So if we have from 0 up to 50, it's there. So 50 plus 40, if you add 50 plus 40, you find that we are going to go all the way to 90, where we have 90 between 80 and 100. That is for these. I hope you can be able to comprehend that. This one has been okay. The first one is 50. 50 plus 40 will go to 90. Now, 90 plus 30 is going to be 120. So, this is the proportion of it like that. So, it is one bar, but we subdivide it into components. We go to the second year, which is 2013. The total year is 170. But out of the 170, 7 for me. So you start from zero. All the way we have 7 between 60 and the 70 again. We have 7 there. We have to go to the line. That is the component for me. That is the component for me. Then 70 plus 30 is go to 100. So you just go back up where we have 100. Then you say that that is the component for is shaded like that. Then the remaining half will be 70 from 100 all the way to 170, which is the height of this. That is the component for which. That is the component for which. Like that. On the same output, 2014, the total is 150. That's why we have a height of 150 here. Then out of the 150, 60. Then make so from zero to where we have 60. That is for the maze. 60 plus 50 is 20. Uh, 110. We just want to take where we have the 110. And then the remaining component is for. Wait, that is actually how we come up with the component. And I find it, this one to be more examinable and remotable. Yeah? They are very much examinable. So you need to know how do we do a more a component background? How do we do a component background? It is just to get the top up, and then you draw a bar that is going to have a height equivalent to the top up. 
And the last bar now, you subdivide it into components that are being represented or they are on the basis of what made that particular total. That total is comprised of what? Each particular item now is going to have its own component like that. What comes out is known as the component that, that is what we call the component bar. The other type of bar is what we call the percentage bar. The percentage bar. Let me add this. For the percentage bar, the values are expressed in the percentages. The values are expressed in the percentages. And each bar, it is going to have a height of 100%. Each bar is going to have a height of 100%. So, this is what normally happens. So, we shall have the years 2012, 2013, 2014. These are the years under consideration. Then we shall have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. Bars. All the bars for these years, they are going to have a height of 100. All of them are going to have a height of 100. When we are feeling the same, the height is 100. Just to make sure that it is at that level of 100. But the rules must be maintained. The bars they must have the same width and they must be uniformly spaced. From there, we will come here and we do some calculations. We will do some calculations here. We start with the year 2012. What is the percentage of maize? What is the percentage of maize? Maize, you have the percentage of 50 out of 120 times 100%. So it is the value for that particular item in that year, divided by the total in that year, then you multiply or you convert it into percentage. So you find that this one is going to be 500 divided by 12. You don't know what it's going to be. Somebody to assist me. For the means, the value is 40 that year divided by 120 times 100%. You get that. For the width, the value for width is 30 over uh, the top of which is 120 times 100 percent. So what do you get for the first case, 2012? Number is super answer. For the main. Sorry? For the main. For the main. 41.66. So maybe we can say either 42 or 41.7. We say for 1.7. For beans? Mm. 33.3. 33.3. Remember the other percentage. Sir. For the width? For the weight, 25. 25%. Did it give you 25 points? 25. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah? Mm. Okay. Actually, if you add this percentage, 25 plus 33.3 plus 41.7, you should be able to total to 100%. Remember, these ones are all percentage. Yeah? The values on the Y axis, they are all in form of percentage. That's why this one is known as a percentage. It is known as the percentage bar graph. So you come now 
and it can divide the bars on the basis of the percentage. For the maize, it is having a percentage of 41.7. So you locate where you have the 1.7 and you cut it like that, you say that is for the maize. For the beans, it is that 3.3. So 41.7 plus 33.3, it will take us to a height of 41.7 plus 33.3. Seventy-five. Sorry. Seventy-five. Seventy-five. Mm. So if you take us where we have seventy-five, which is around there, we say that is the proposal for for the beans. The remaining part is for the meat. You do the same for the year twenty nineteen. You will come here. You do for the maize. The maize, the production was 70 over 170 times 100 percent. You get that. For the beans, the production is 90 over 170 times 100 percent. For the wheat, it's going to be 70 over 170 times 100 percent. So you do those computations. Once you get those percentages, you come again and you subdivide that particular year or the values of the bar for that year. You subdivide it on the basis of the percentages that we're going to get there. The same way we have done here. So whatever comes out, it is now going to be called the percentage bar. The percentage bar. Any question up to that point? You seem to be okay. That that is how we do it. So, um, the notes that I'm going to share with you. They are well explained, and actually, there are also examples that are uh, given to enhance your understanding. Then, uh, if you are now okay on how to do the bar graph, then allow me to do another method of presenting data known as the histogram. 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 So it is actually a method of data presentation in which the bars are normally going to the end, as opposed to the bar graph or the bar chart, whereby we have got spaces between one bar and the other one. In the histogram, all the bars are normally going to the end. There is no space between one bar and the other. They are all joined together, and from there, we can be able to get that particular history. So it is normally going to happen when we have a data we call blue data. It is normally grown using the blue data. Grown to data, it is actually the data that we say it is a continuous. Data that is organized into classes. And in each class, we have got the lower limit and the upper limit. In each class, we are going to have the lower limit and the academic. Like, for example, if it is an examination that was done, and then you are told that the performance of the candidates or the students was presented as shown in the table. So, you have the marks, those who scored 0 to 10,
the number of holes which we normally call the number of students which is also known as frequency the number of students so those who score zero to ten percent maybe they were three students those who scored between ten to twenty they were maybe six students those who scored between 20 and 30, maybe they were eight students. Those who scored between 30 and 40, maybe they were five students. And those who scored between 40 and 50, let's say they were four students. And now you are told, you present this information on a histogram to present this information on a histogram. If you are going to present the information on a histogram, then your histogram should behave like shown here. It is going to be like this. Down here, we are going to have the marks. Remember the lowest mark the student can get is zero. The highest the student can get is 50. So you start here from zero uh, up to 50. That means go to 10, 20, up to 50. Then we have their 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. This is our x axis. That is our x axis at that time. Then the number of students are going to be on the y axis, the frequency. The frequency is normally on the y axis. So the highest we have is eight. So I can consider to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I will come here and draw my histogram as follows. Those who scored the zero to ten. That is 0 to 10, they are 3. So I'm going to have 3, 3, like that. There is that bar that is from 0 to 10. That bar should go as high as where we have 3. So 0 to 10, it is 3. Then the second class is from 10 to, 10 to 20. 10 to 20, that is from 10 here to 20 there, they are six students. So this particular region it is going to work as half. As high as that. Six. Then the class of 20 to 30, which is here 20 to 30, there are eight. Students, so make sure it's like one up to where we have eight, and then like that. 20 to 30, eight students. Then 30 to 40, they were five. So 30 to 40, that particular bar, we have a kind of size. And lastly, 40 to 50, which is 40 to 50, it is 4. So you can get where you are 4. That is your histogram. That is your histogram. You can be able to see in an histogram, there is no gap between one bar and the other. All of them are actually going together or they are compact. They are actually adjacent to each other. And why are they so? The reason why they are joined together is because where the first bar ends, where the first bar ends is exactly where the second bar starts from. And that is actually as a result of this. It is zero to 10. For this particular class, the lower limit is zero, the upper limit is 10. The upper limit of this class is the lower limit of the next class. The upper limit for that next class is 20. So the upper limit of this class is the lower limit of this. So where this one ends from 0 to 10, 
the other one starts from there, yeah, 10 to 20, the other one starts from there, yeah, 20 to 30, the other one starts there, yeah, 30 to 40. Therefore, at the end of the day, all these parts are going to be compact. They are going to be one. We don't have space. But for the bar graph, there must be space between one bar and the other. So we need to observe those rules. We need to observe those rules. Sometimes you can be given in that part that uh, if grown the way it is, the histogram will not come out being compact. The histogram is going to have some spaces between one bar and the other. And it is your responsibility as a student to make it continuous. You can be given information like this. You can be given information like this. Maybe you are given data. You are given data that you can, maybe it is age, you are given from zero to nine, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39. You are given that kind of information. If you draw this uh, histogram from this particular data, your histogram is not going to be like this. And remember, and remember, your histogram should not have gaps. It must be continuous. If we go ahead and draw this, we realize that whenever we have it like zero, up to where we talk about zero, uh, the other one ends at nine. This one ends at nine, but the next one is at ten. So you see there's a gap here from nine to ten. There's a gap. The other one ends at 19, but the next class starts from 20. This one ends at 19, the next one starts at 20. It is your responsibility to make this particular data to be continuous. And how do you make this data to be continuous like this one? What you do, you will get what we call the real. These are actually, let me cut the fresh. You will have to consider what we call real limits. Real limits. Real limits, it is simple. You add, add 0 0.5. Add 0 0.5 to add limits. To get the real limits. You add 0 0.5 to add limits, then you less. 0 0.5 from lower limits. All the upper limits, you add 0 0.5. So what are you going to get? Uh, apart from the first one, apart from the first lower limit, but this upper limit, upper limit we are saying we add. Remember upper limits are these. Uh, 0 to 9, 9 is the upper limit, 10 to 19 is the upper limit, 20 to 29, 29 is the upper limit, and then here we have that 9, that 9 is the upper limit. To all these upper limits, we add 0 0.5, so we are going to have to 9.5 to 19.5 to 29.5 to that 9.5. The upper limits, they are going to be increased by 0 0.5. The lower limits, apart from the starting, the lower limits of the others, they are going to be subtracted 0 0.5. So 10 minus 0 0.5 is going to be 9.5. 20 minus 0 0.5 is going to be 19.5. 30 minus 0 0.5 is going to be 29.5. You realize that now, where this class ends, it is where the other one starts from. Where this one ends is where this one starts from, and where this one ends is where this one starts from. And if now you draw your histogram, your histogram is going to be joined together. So you need to be very observant on the data that has been provided to you. If the data is like this, then you don't have to do anything, you just go. But if your data is having gaps, the same we have here, you need to have them continuous. By getting what you call the real limit. 
clear limits are obtained by adding 0.5 to upper limits, multiplied by the to less than 0.5 to the lower limits. So if you draw this, if you draw this one, you will find that you are going to use now the real limits. You use the real limits. So we have 0, uh, 9.5. We just use 0, 9.5, then we go to 19.5, 29.5, and 99.5, like that. So 0 to 9.5, to get the value and we draw it. It was not given, the frequency was not given, but it's given. The other one, like that, we find that now you are, you are, this program is going to be very okay. It is going to be compact. Add 0 0.5 to upper limit, there's 0 0.5 to lower limit, but not always. That one is only done when the, the, the data is not continuous. If it is continuous like this, don't do anything. This data is very okay. Draw the histogram using that. Draw the histogram using that. So, so that I can be able to finish on the data presentation. The last item that you need to do is known as the is known as the frequency polygon. The frequency polygon I'm going just to mention. But if you are able to grow the histogram, you are able to grow the bandwidth, then you are almost, almost sorted in this particular area of data presentation. The frequency polygon. It is normally drawn using the midpoints of the classes. It is normally drawn using the midpoints of the classes. The midpoints. Remember, these are the classes. Anything that is from this to this, from this to this, these are the classes. Then you need to get the midpoints. The midpoints. The midpoints. The midpoints are normally drawn as follows. You are the lower limit plus the upper limit divided by two. So, right here, you know what 10 is 10, 10 divided by two is 9. 10 plus 20 is 30, 30 divided by two is 15. 20 plus 30 is 50, 50 divided by two is 25. 30 plus 40 is 70, divided by two is 35. And this one will be 19 divided by two is 25. So, your frequency polygon is going to be drawn using the midpoints. You are going to use the midpoints on the x axis. Here, you are going to use the midpoints. And here, you are going to use the frequencies. Here, you are going to use the frequencies, whereas here, you are going to use the midpoints. And actually, now you have zero. I, the midpoints are zero, uh, we have I, 15, 25, 35, and 45. Those are the midpoints. Then, when the midpoint is five, the frequency is three. So, I, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. When we have the midpoint at five, the frequency is three. When the midpoint is 15, frequency is six. 15, six, When the midpoint is 25, this one is eight. When this one is at five, the frequency is five. five, the frequency is five. Some of them are marked. Asking for five, four, for five, four, you go and mark right now. Whatever comes out now, you join with straight lines. You salura, you make that. You salura, you make that. You salura, you make that. That. And always don't give you up. Frequency polygon hanging. Then maybe you join it to the previous minimum. Previous many points actually to assume the outer class here from maybe negative 10 to 0. The middle point would have been something like that. And then you are done. 
normally we need in the origin or right back. So this is the frequency problem using the midpoints and the frequencies. The midpoints have shown you how to get it. Lower limit, upper limit, add them, divide by two. This plus this divided by two, get this. So the midpoints are going to be on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we use the frequencies that you are provided. And that gives you the frequencies for the This is known as the frequency. The frequency for That is it. So, with that, I want us to end our class at that point, unless somebody has a question. Yes. So if there's no question, we stop there for today. We shall communicate or we shall meet again next week on on uh, Wednesday. Otherwise, enjoy your evening. You too. You too. You too. Nice weekend. Okay, you too, you too.